Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may fervently love you and worthily magnify your holy name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May St. Catherine of Stenning pray, pray for us, and Wilfred of York pray, pray for us, and Richard of Chichester pray, pray for us, St. Louisa of Alfriston pray, pray for us, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom Pray, Pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome, uh, both here and online, to uh, this week's Wednesday conference, continuing our new theme uh, on tradition. And uh, the question this week is, tradition, how is it lived, is what I put online, but really I suppose what I mean is, uh, how is it living? Now, you may recall that last week uh, we reflected on how uh, tradition, sacred tradition, is a living tradition, and it is living because we are alive. Uh, that we, as the church, as ecclesia, meaning called out, are uh, ourselves the summation of 2,000 years of wisdom, of spirituality, of experience, of lived faith, of testimony, of martyrdom, uh, of all uh, the various ways of prayer and worship. Uh, we are the summation of it all. We None of us would be here uh, as Christians without tradition, without sacred tradition. It is, as we reflected last week, sacred tradition that has maintained and continued for us uh, the worship of God, the holy sacraments that gave us and confirmed and affirmed for us uh, uh, the uh, divine revelation and the scriptures. So in what way is it living, we might say, within us? So sacred tradition is lived in the Theophany. Now, do you remember from uh, Epiphany Tide what the word Theophany means? But it means basically the, re the revelation of God. So the Feast of the Epiphany, remember three kings, yeah. uh, we celebrate the Theophany as well, which was the revelation of Christ uh, at his baptism in the River Jordan uh, by St John the Baptist, when the dove appeared, the first time that the uh, three persons of the Trinity are uh, revealed in one place and at the same time. So we have uh, Christ, the Son of God, we have uh, the Holy Spirit as the dove, and we have the voice from heaven saying, this is my Son, the Beloved. But Theophany, so Theophany means really revelation of God, or God's revelation. So how is Theophany lived uh, in the church today? Well, of course, firstly, in divine revelation, in scripture, in the uh, apostolic teaching that has been passed on from generations to generations to our own day, and in every individual who has received that sacred tradition. So everyone who has received the scriptures, uh, everyone who has received the apostolic faith, uh, who have uh, experienced theophany, experienced God's revelation to them. Mm. Similarly too, we experience lived theophany, God's revelation, in the divine liturgy, in the way we worship. The sacred tradition of worship, which as we, ref we, uh, we reflected last week, has come down to us from the ages. Remember, um, uh, we have St Ignatius of Antioch writing at the very a beginning of the second century, who lived at the end of the first century, uh, who was taught by St. John the Beloved, uh, speaking about the Eucharist, speaking already about uh, the bread and the wine becoming the flesh and the blood of Christ, speaking already about bishops and priests and deacons and the ministry, the hierarchy of the church. Um, 
And similarly, by 150, between 150 and 155, we have the writings of St. Justin Martyr, also describing to us Sunday worship, describing to us the Mass, the liturgy. So through, again, uh, the divine liturgy, so throughout the centuries, that same way, that same form of worship or similar forms of worship throughout those 2,000 years, individuals have experienced the living tradition of the church and we still experience that today. Every Mass we offer here, we are uh, living the sacred tradition of the church contained in the divine liturgy. <clears throat> we also live theophany, God's revelation, uh, to us through theological study, uh, through the application of received wisdom, uh, all of which comes to us again in the sacred tradition. And each of us lives that because as we study the scriptures, as we read the scriptures, as we uh, study uh, the fathers of the church, as, as we study the, uh, the faith, the doctrines of the faith, um, God is revealed to us as individuals. So similarly then, we live sacred tradition in the theophany, in the revelation of God, in our individual and personal experience, as well as in the collective, uh, in the fellowship of the church. And also too, through which then we receive the insights and the wisdom and the knowledge of those who have gone before us and those who are around us. So the spiritual practitioners and teachers those who have taught us how to pray, those who have taught us how to meditate. But as well in our own prayer, in our own meditation, we also experience theophany. We also experience, I hope, uh, moments when God is revealed to us, when we have those epiphany moments, when we feel the nearness of the presence of God in our lives. And of course, we live tradition as Ecclesia as the church, as the body of Christ called out from the world, made citizens of heaven by virtue of our baptism, united with the church throughout the ages. So we are the church militant here on earth, the present church, united with the church triumphant in heaven, the saints who have gone before us, and of course the church expectant uh, that is waiting uh, for the Lord's coming. In all these wise, we are experiencing the living tradition of the church. And how do we know that it's authentic tradition? And here, of course, as we've said before, through consensus and consistency. The very fact that uh, we can read the writings of St Ignatius of Antioch dating from 110 approximately AD and recognise and know exactly what it is he is talking about and what he is, he is referring to. St Vincent of Lewins tells us that the Catholic faith is that which has been believed always and everywhere and by all. And as I've said before, that's a good ready reckoner, as it were, uh, to recognise authentic uh, Catholic and Orthodox teaching. Does it, have, uh, does it have the testimony of the ages behind it? Can it be referenced in the preceding 2,000 years? Have the fathers written about it? Are there verses in scripture relevant to it? Uh, have the apostles taught it? Have it? Has it always been something believed everywhere and by all? And so we know, for example, with uh, the various uh, suggestions I gave before about how uh, sacred tradition is living in and with us and through us, we know again, so for example, in the Divine Liturgy, we know that the majority of Christians throughout the 2,000 years have worshipped uh, in that way. We know that the Mass has been the central, most important form of worship for Christians from the very beginning. We know that despite the slight variations in 
really cultural variations or small developmental variations between the East and the West. Nonetheless, the same formula, the same format, the same process, the same beliefs, the same prayerful intentions are all there and have always been there. Again, we have the confidence here, uh, using the Divine Liturgy of St. Gregory, to know that for at least 1500 years, the form of Mass that we still receive and celebrate every day here uh, has that continuity, has that familiarity and that similarity, so that were St. Gregory the Great himself to appear at Mass tomorrow morning, he would know exactly what was going on. And of course the beauty too of the traditional liturgy in Latin is that any saint in the West for the last 1500 years could go to anywhere in the world, more or less, and would know what was going on, would be familiar uh, with the language, would be familiar with the form of service, would know exactly what it was all about. And before that, of course, before the introduction of Latin in the fourth century, uh, predominantly in the West, in common with the East was Greek. Greek was the common language of the liturgy originally. And that's why uh, for so many centuries, uh, right up until the last century, it was usual for seminarian students, for uh, those being formed for priesthood, uh, and for those who studied uh, divinity, who studied theology, uh, to learn Latin, to learn Greek, even some of them to learn Hebrew, all so that this great wealth of knowledge uh, collated over the centuries could be understood, could be read. And it's a great shame, as I've said before, that today, um, in what passes for uh, theological formation, uh, these languages are very rarely taught. And certainly uh, Latin, uh, you may find places where uh, you can take an optional Hebrew course or you can take an optional uh, New Testament Greek course, um, but very rare that you will be offered, even in the study of theology, uh, the opportunity to study Latin. And depending on uh, the lottery that is our school education system today, uh, you may or may not have been given the opportunity to study Latin at school. At, uh, I was going to say O level then, but is it still GCSEs? I don't know. Um, and, and A levels. There are some places that, um, that, that teach uh, Latin, but very few. Um, and actually, this has reached a, uh, uh, is beginning to affect even the Vatican, where there is a dearth of, of Latin speakers. Uh, now, and that's, you know, this is uh, a place that for 2,000 years, more or less, or for at least, uh, let's say, 1,800 years, um, has more or less had Latin as its um, official language. So that over all those centuries, um, decrees, uh, letters, um, etc., were all published in Latin. When bishops met together in synod, uh, they would speak in Latin. Um, at, even at Vatican II, um, the speeches, etc., uh, were made in Latin. The, the, the clergy were expected to have such a proficiency, certainly uh, those who were bishops and those who were uh, teachers, theological professors, were all expected to um, have that familiarity, such a familiarity and fluidity um, in Latin, um, so that uh, they could speak uh, in council. All of that sadly is gone. Um, there are still uh, Latin courses uh, in Rome, but uh, since the 60s or since the 70s, um, uh, Latin, of course, in the wider church um, has tended not to be used. Many people resorted completely to the vernacular for the liturgy, which of course was not the intention of the uh, Vatican II uh, uh, bishops. Their intention was that some vernacular may be used, but otherwise Latin was to be the predominant language of the liturgy. Um, all of that's changed. 
which means, of course, that in the various seminaries throughout the world, outside of Rome, there's been no, uh, they've not perceived the need, really, uh, to teach Latin, certainly not to the level that they used to teach it. Um, which means then, of course, there are now generations of bishops uh, and other clergy who don't have the familiarity with Latin. Um, I was reading something the other day um, uh, where um, the late uh, Cormac Murphy O'Connor, who was Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster and before that previously was Bishop of Arundel and Brighton here, the local Roman Catholic Diocese here, um, spoke uh, at a Bishop's Synod and it said in, in, in an execrable Latin, uh, trying to make his, his point. Um, and, and he had two doctorates. He had a doctorate in, in philosophy and a doctorate in sacred theology. Um, but uh, he, could, he could barely uh, uh, give a speech uh, in Latin uh, at a synod. Um, and of course the great problem, the great fear that I have and others similarly, um, is that with that dearth of Latin suddenly will become lost all this wisdom and knowledge of the centuries because there will be fewer people able to, to read it. Um, true enough, that a lot of it has been translated, a lot of it has been translated, um, but obviously, you know, but we all know that sometimes, uh, you know, things can be lost in translation, mm -hmm. or nuances can be lost in translation. Not only that, um, you know, there, there, there are two ways, aren't there, of, of translating. Uh, there's the, uh, the sort of um, laborious way of sitting with a grammar book and a dictionary and going line by line, word by word, uh, literally translating and then trying to put it all, pull it all together into a, a phrase or to make sense of it. Or there's that uh, translation that familiarity can give with ease, that knows the nuances, knows the phrases and the styles, recognises the idioms, uh, etc., and the rhythm of a language. Um, so. You know, it's, it's, it's a great pity that, you know, to, there are uh, few, uh, in the, even in the papal office uh, in recent years, uh, who could have penned uh, the beautiful hymns the previous pontiffs did, or uh, the wonderful eulogies or tombstone engravings that uh, other popes once did. All of that uh, is sadly gone. Even uh, Benedict XVI, great mind, and theologian as uh, as he is, um, is is no great Latin scholar, um, and that's a great shame. And I'm not suggesting either that I'm any better. Um, uh, I've probably f um, forgotten uh, uh, most of most of what I had to learn. But but with the familiarity of saying mass every day. And, with and, and reading the lections, the readings every day, first in Latin and then in English, and saying my office in Latin, um, I have a, you know, a, a certain familiarity, a certain level of familiarity and understanding, so I can still translate the odd tombstone or um, clerk or memorial. Um, but of course, even then, within Latin, there's a difference between classical and ecclesiastical and so on and so forth. But all of that, sadly, is, going, is, is in danger of being lost at the present time. However, of course, also too, though, there is a, uh, a new upsurge uh, in uh, tradition uh, within the Roman Catholic, with the contemporary Roman Catholic Church. Um, there are uh, younger clergy coming up through the ranks now who, um, uh, who uh, have fallen in love with the beauty of the traditional Mass. Um, and the customs, the old traditional customs, and there may well be, perhaps in the next 20 or 30 years, uh, something of a uh, return, uh, more wide scale to tradition uh, in the Roman Communion. That is certainly to, something to be hoped and prayed for, um, and let us hope that it might be taken up again, or that it, or it might have some influence uh, in academia uh, within the Catholic universities again, such that um, true uh, Latin scholarship will not be lost. Oh, that's right.
So consensus. Uh, so consensus is how is the uh, is the uh, gives us the authenticity uh, for tradition. Now, how do we live that here? I've already spoken about uh, the divine liturgy, um, but I did say that this series would give uh, some uh, historical um, background, uh, as it were, to uh, the um, nature uh, of this uh, particular mission and to uh, Orthodox Catholicism. Now we are here generally known uh, by sort of two names, Western Orthodox and Old Roman Catholic. And the two are mm, kind of synonymous, or we should hope that they will be. Western Orthodox, of course, refers to the fact that um, uh, we are inclined to an, the Orthodox uh, understanding and interpretation and tradition of the Catholic faith an old Roman Catholic because uh, we uh, have maintained uh, the traditions and the customs and the culture uh, of uh, Roman Catholicism through the ages. Now let me explain that a bit more. So Orthodox and Catholic, now you will understand uh, that these, both these words have a variety of meanings uh, in terms of terminology. Catholic, of course, as a word, means simply universal. Uh, applied to theology, uh, Catholic uh, is generally understood to mean, or to be a kind of code word for, um, the Catholic and apostolic faith. In other words, the original faith of the apostles. Orthodox, now of course, orthodox as a word means right teaching. Um, and when applied to Catholicism, so a phrase like Orthodox Catholic, on belief, which was uh, the East and the West. Uh, in the East, you had the patriarchates of Jerusalem, Alexandria, Antioch, and eventually Constantinople. And in the West, you had uh, the patriarchy of uh, Rome. The great, the first uh, seven great ecumenical councils of the church uh, took place when the church was one. So it's easy, it's, it's easy to say basically that in the first millennium of the church's existence there was but one church of Jesus Christ. However, events in 1054 uh, brought about um, a uh, division. Essentially, um, there was a falling out between uh, the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch in Constantinople. The Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, the Patriarch of the West, sent a papal legate uh, called Cardinal um, uh, Humber, I think, um, yeah, to uh, Constantinople to remonstrate with the Patriarch. When he arrived, uh, he was none too diplomatic or courteous in his manner. Uh, so they had, uh, he personally and uh, the Patriarch had a falling out. The next day, the Cardinal returned, uh, marched through while the Patriarch was celebrating the Divine Liturgy. So literally, in the cathedral in Constantinople, uh, the Patriarch is celebrating Mass and Cardinal Humber comes with his party, marches in during the Mass right up to the altar and places on the altar an edict of, or a decree of excommunication. The Cardinal believing that he had the power and the authority uh, to do so from the Pope in Rome. Needless to say that that was responded by the Patriarch with a similar decree of excommunication. And largely that is um, the event that most refer to when you hear the term the Great Schism of 1054. Now, 
but in effect um, it didn't really happen it took a couple of centuries really uh, for any major difference to happen that is to say that unbeknownst to the cardinal uh, the Pope in Rome had died and therefore making his declaration of excommunication null and absolutely void um, the patriarch uh, had only excommunicated the cardinal he had not excommunicated the Bishop of Rome nor had he excommunicated the whole of the Western Church so it took a long time for people to realize that there had been any kind of argument whatsoever remember that we, these are the days long before um, the internet, Facebook, social media, Instagram, etc., etc. Um, you know, it's it's not as if Cardinal Humber could say, uh, take a selfie, say, decree of excommunication. Um, so news would take ages. Um, some people, and I was listening to somebody, something the other day, and uh, they made they made a salient point. You know, for many people. Um, many Christians at various points in history wouldn't, wouldn't know who the Pope was, wouldn't have known the name of the Pope. Especially sometimes when you had the quick changes or when you had at one time three Popes. Um, uh, your ordinary common or garden Christian in the street um, probably was oblivious to all of that. And certainly uh, any difference between East and West um, uh, people were, were unaware of. What really brought about um, the significant difference between East and West um, uh, were the Crusades, uh, when sadly, um, uh, when sadly Western Crusaders, um, not being familiar uh, with the culture and traditions of the East, um, didn't uh, recognised, were ignorant um, uh, that uh, Christians in the East had uh, different traditions and looked different, etc., and uh, sacked uh, Constantinople. And that really um, is what put, really set the cat amongst the pigeons and really has made a, a separation between uh, East and West. Um, now, there are um, various uh, theological points of view that are at variance between the East and the West. Um, most of those really are uh, in perception. Um, so for example, um, you will notice that here at Mass we don't say the filioque, which is a phrase in the Creed uh, that says that, uh, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, and the Son, filioque is and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified and spake by the prophets. Um, now the original wording of the creed, agreed at Nicaea in 325, and subsequently again agreed uh, in 385, did not have the words and the Son. And it wasn't until the 7th, 8th century that a local synod um, in Italy inserted the words and they inserted the words because they were making the point against Arians that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, the Arians you may remember from our series on heresies uh, believed, didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. They believed that he was a creature. So the local synod, uh, Pistoia I think, uh, inserted the words and the Son to make the point to emphasize the divinity of Jesus and it was so intended really as a local concession however for all sorts of reasons uh, the practice spread so that eventually by certainly by the, the 13th 14th centuries uh, in the west the filioque was common everywhere but without a council an ecumenical council so an ecumenical council being of all the bishops around the world uh, gathered to agree the new wording that had never happened. Now the East to this day therefore maintain um, that the West are in error, some of them put it more strongly, some of them will say that the West is in apostasy, some will say that the West is uh, heretical um, because of this phrase filioque added to the creed. 
Um, but really, uh, there, is, uh, there is really no theological problem quite. Um, that's not quite true. Um, it really is a difference in perception. Um, where the Orthodox are quite right uh, is to say, well, it wasn't the original wording. There is something to suggest that um, uh, it's, it's theologically incorrect to say that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. Um, certainly Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and speaks of, of doing so, but the, the Holy Spirit doesn't come from Jesus. So it's, it's all to do with, with what's called double procession. Um, but we won't get into that because it's, it's very complicated. But the point is, um, that's an example of where East and West now seemingly um, differ uh, in terms of uh, doctrine. But really it's not that big a deal. The, the real issue, or really the issue is, is on both sides, is, is hurt pride um, and feelings. Um, the East, uh, certainly justifiably so, regarding the insertion of words into an otherwise uh, agreed statement of faith, uh, certainly for the sack of Constantinople and the treat their treatment at the hands of Crusaders, um, and also to the um, uh, tendency of the papacy uh, to regard itself um, as the sole source um, of authority uh, in the church. And of course it was that growing sense or, or development of the papal ministry that um, eventually led uh, to uh, the split uh, within, well not the split, but a, but a, a difference of understanding between the uh, Roman Catholic Church in Holland and uh, the Vatican. Now, at the Reformation, uh, Holland had been a Catholic country. Um, then it became Protestant and the uh, Catholics were forbidden to worship publicly. Um, now you can go to uh, Amsterdam and you can see two beautiful examples, one very famous, of how uh, Catholics were accommodated. Um, typical Dutch uh, being fairly easygoing, uh, an accord, an agreement, was reached between uh, the Protestant rulers uh, and the Catholics to say, well, obviously, you know, you can't be seen to be worshipping, you can't be publicly worshipping. Obviously, we've confiscated the churches. Um, but if you gather together in your own homes and said mass, well, you know, it's not public, is it? So that uh, there's a wonderful place called Our Lord in the Attic, uh, which it needs to be seen to be believed, but if you can imagine a traditional uh, 16th century um, Dutch uh, townhouse on a canal in Amsterdam, so it's about um, seven stories uh, high, um, but actually it's only three stories inside. The top four stories have been taken out and inside is a huge church with an altar, balconies, an organ, uh, the lot. The first three floors were a, a private house uh, of, of a merchant uh, and so you could only, you know, you had to be known to be, to get access as it were, uh, but then you go in and you go through the main reception rooms, through the house and you come to the top of the stairs and it opens out into this huge four-storey church. Um, but from the outside, it just looks like a normal, usual seven-storey townhouse. But on the inside, is something else. So I mention that deliberately because uh, the Catholics then had made an accommodation and were living and getting on quite well with their Protestant neighbours. Then came the Counter-Reformation, the Council of Trent, and a certain body known as the Society of Jesus, also commonly known as the Jesuits.
Now, their great charge, their great commission, of course, was uh, to spread the Catholic faith. And they came charging into Holland and uh, uh, behaved as if uh, this was completely Protestant territory and therefore uh, open uh, for their Catholic mission. This, of course, started causing problems. It caused problems because uh, the Jesuits were running about getting themselves arrested and generally making a nuisance of themselves uh, and causing problems between the existing Catholic Church uh, and the Protestant rulers. The Protestant rulers, of course, turning to the local Catholic Church and saying, you know, who are these guys? You know, this, this is not on. We have, we have an agreement. You can do what you like behind closed doors, but you can't do this stuff. And the Catholic Church in Holland, of course, um, were upset uh, because of this disturbance that the Jesuits were causing. So the, the Catholic Church in Holland appealed uh, to Rome and said, can you call off these Jesuits? Um, because it's not helping the situation here. Uh, there is a Catholic Church here. We're it. Um, we, you know, we get on fine with them. With, with, uh, we have an understanding with the Protestants that's allowed us to continue to worship and hold our, practice our faith. Um, we don't, you know, this is, this is causing unnecessary ructions. Sadly, of course, uh, the popes by this time uh, had, uh, you know, upset themselves over the Reformation, um, uh, rather liked the work that the Jesuits were doing, and rather liked the fact that the Jesuits were annoying the Protestants. Um, and then the Jesuits falsely accused uh, the Archbishop of Utrecht, a certain Peter Codd, um, accused him falsely of heresy uh, because of course they, 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 felt they thought he was a nuisance to them um, they didn't like the fact that he was complaining to Rome etc and so Peter Card the Archbishop was called to Rome to face an ecclesiastical tribunal now the only problem with that apart from the fact that the um, allegations were false is also that a previous pope had promised the Catholics in Holland uh, that if they were ever to be tried ecclesiast ecclesiastically, it would always be on Dutch soil, that they would never have to go to a foreign church court, that they would be tried in their own territory. Um, when Peter Carl got to Rome, he went through this trial, he was found to be uh, the the allegations were proven to be false, um, and he returned to Holland not long after Dai. And this meant there was a vacancy. Now, um, Rome, by this time, was trying to assert uh, a right, a privilege, to appoint any bishops anywhere in the world. And this was not always the tradition of the church. Um, the tradition originally, of course, had been for the local church to elect one of the priests to become the bishop. Uh, as things developed, um, there were variations in different places, um, but uh, the cathedral chapter of Utrecht were given a right in perpetuity by, again, the Pope uh, to elect their own bishops. So when Peter Card had died and uh, there was a vacant see, uh, Rome determined and, you know, egged on by the Jesuits, uh, wanted to put their own man uh, in the job. Uh, and a man was appointed and sent, and the canons of the cathedral chapter of Utrecht barred the doors and barred the man from Rome uh, from entering, saying, no, we have our own, we have a right to have our own election and we'll appoint our own bishop. Then, for about 200 years, there was a uh, sort of toing and froing of, of arguing. Um, all the Catholic universities uh, uh, upheld uh, the um, uh, position of uh, the church in Holland. Um, defending their right uh, to elect their own bishops. Um, all the canon lawyers uh, agreed, uh, but uh, Rome didn't. And of course, what was happening 
was Rome was beginning to centralise uh, all its, its authority and power. Uh, eventually, all thing, this uh, sort of came to a head in 1853, when Pius IX, um, then Bishop of Rome, uh, rather than answering, rather than dealing with this canonical dispute between Holland and, and Rome, um, did a deal behind the church in Holland's back with the Protestant rulers and established a new Roman Catholic hierarchy. And that's when the term old began to be used because then you had in Holland uh, the old Roman Catholic Church in Holland, so the original Catholic Church, um, and then you have this new hierarchy and new Catholic Church law to the Pope. And to cut a, a longer story short, uh, essentially we come from, we are, we come from, we originate from that original Dutch Church. So that's why we're sometimes called, and often or often called, old Roman Catholics. Um, now that began, it, initially it just meant in Holland between the originals and the new. Later however it became a doctrinal thing, because in 1854, a year later, Pius IX uh, declared as dogma the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now here again, this now is a point of variance with orthodoxy with the East. For although the term immaculate has been used of and applied to Our Lady for many centuries, whilst all are essentially agreed that Our Lady uh, was pure, that uh, she was uh, uh, sinless in the sense that she, had, she didn't commit any sin because she was so attuned to the will of God, um, and therefore is held as, an, as has always been held as a, an exemplar, a, 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 a perfect Christian disciple for all other Christian disciples to follow. Um, the notion behind this immaculate conception uh, dogma uh, was not part of the received Orthodox Catholic faith. Indeed, Many doctors of the church and great theologians, master theologians in preceding centuries had um, absolutely poo-pooed the notion or said that such a dogma was unnecessary. Now again, I don't want to go into the details of what the dogma is, but suffice to say that it was a novelty. It was a, something new. And what's worse was that Pius IX introduced it unilaterally of his own authority. He didn't call a council of bishops. That's in 1854. In 1870, he calls the First Vatican Council. And at the First Vatican Council, of course, he's introduced uh, the notion of papal infallibility. And, of course, that too was a uh, a novelty. Indeed, Roman Catholic catechisms, uh, even in this country, in the beginning of the 19th century, had uh, said that and stated that papal infallibility was a Protestant slur on the Catholic faith. In other words, this is a this is a false Protestant um, notion that um, we Catholics believe that the Pope is infallible. So, the notion of papal infallibility was a complete novelty. Now, what's been confused with it was that, of course, for centuries, um, in the West particularly, the Pope was considered top dog in the church. And of course, generally speaking, you did as the top dog said, it goes without saying. Um, but with this notion of papal infallibility came this understanding that the Pope had complete authority, complete and sole power authority over the whole church so that uh, the suggestion was that the Pope could so the suggestion was for example whereas previously in the church always the bishop of the diocese was top dog for the local church in that diocese 
Suddenly in 1870, the notion was, no, 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 the, the Pope in Rome is actually the top dog in every diocese, and the bishop works for him. So there was this notion of universal supremacy uh, for the Pope. Uh, they had universal jurisdiction everywhere in the world, irrespective of the other bishops and patriarchs and archbishops and metropolitans and everything else. Um, and almost to suggest um, that, um, that instead of your parish priest, that really your parish priest was there on behalf of the Pope, instead of your bishop being being Christ to the local church in your place, he was simply there as the vicar of the Pope. So basically the Pope uh, is the first uh, parish priest of all parishes, is the, is the bishop of all dioceses, etc, etc. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lots of kind of, uh, there's a lot more to it in terms of nuances and cultural uh, things to it, but essentially that's what papal infallibility Brought about. It was a novelty. It wasn't what the church had always uh, had experienced before or thought before. Included in there was the notion, for example, that the Pope was above an ecumenical council, was above a general council of the church, that the Pope could introduce, could proclaim dogmas without consulting anybody else. If he proclaimed them ex cathedra from the chair of St. Peter in Rome, um, which um, Pius IX proceeded then to do retrospectively for the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of 1854, and which of course later Pius XII would do for the uh, dogma of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So these variances, of course, in, in dogma, well, the, the old Catholics in Holland uh, said, well, pfft, this is ridiculous now. There's, you know, not only have we been shoved aside by a new hierarchy, not only have, um, before that we were falsely accused, accused of this, that and everything else, our rights were trampled over, um, now they're introducing, he's introducing these new dogmas. Um, uh, you know, where, where can we go from here? Well, during and after the, the First Vatican Council, there were other Roman Catholics around uh, uh, the world uh, who similarly couldn't accept these new um, dogmas. And so they formed what was called the Union of Old Catholic Churches, or the Utrecht Union of Old Catholic Churches. And they looked to the Holland Church, the Dutch Church, um, for oversight. But many of them uh, were... Um, reformers, uh, we might say. We might say people who um, had uh, Protestant tendencies. Um, uh, forgive me, in many ways, we might say that some, many of them were very sort of Anglican uh, in, their, in their attitude, who kind of wanted to reconcile Protestant and, and Catholic traditions together. So that by the turn of the 20th century, um, things had reached a stage where some of the uh, members of the Utrecht Union uh, couldn't, couldn't agree um, with some of the novelties that were then being introduced. And they turned to the Orthodox East. Recognising that reconciliation with Rome was probably not going to happen in their lifetime, recognising that Traditionally, according to sacred tradition, the local church does need to be plugged in to the wider church through a patriarch. And recognising that St Peter was Bishop of Antioch before he was Bishop of Rome, they appealed to the Patriarchate of Orth uh, the Orthodox Patriarchate in Antioch um, and subsequently of Alexandria and were received and recognised by both and taken into the Orthodox Catholic Church, establishing then essentially Western Orthodoxy. Western because Latin rite, traditions, customs, uh, etc., uh, but Orthodox um, meaning 
right-believing Catholics. So they gave up the filioque um, and uh, uh, reconciled, really, uh, the developments between East and West doctrinally um, and dogmatically that were not at variance with otherwise the whole of sacred tradition and it effectively brought about um, an early tentative union of East and West um, almost a thousand years after the original kind of um, schism and that is the church that this mission belongs to, that is the church of which uh, I'm a bishop, um, and that is, you know, cutting lots of corners, <laughs> uh, but that's essentially our history. Now, of course, the important thing for the old Roman Catholics, all the way through this and to us in the present time, has been this holding fast to sacred tradition. Um, holding fast to that which has always been believed everywhere and taught by all. Um, and that is, is remains uh, our MO, our modus operandi, it remains our raison d'etre, our reason for being to this day, to maintain in the Latin Western expression that faith which has always been believed everywhere and by all. Um, and that is why we here particularly would say of ourselves that we are living sacred tradition. That we, have, uh, we are maintaining orthodoxy, we are maintaining all the traditions and customs uh, and everything else that are developed in the West, um, but are in harmony too with our brethren uh, in the East, uh, in all the points of doctrine and dogma that matter. Um,